I played nine years in the NFL and was able to walk away on my own terms. I was fired six times. I was rejected. I was demoted. I was stuck in the friend zone. Anybody ever been stuck in the friend zone? Don't raise your hand. Just blink. Just blink real fast. Okay, I see one. I see two. I see three. I don't mean it like that. I mean like I was constantly on teams that say, Justin, we like you, but we don't love you. Not in that way. They didn't want to commit to me. So I bounced around the first couple of years. But I was able to stay because I excelled at the controllables in the shadows. My attitude, my effort, my preparation. But how many of you know, even in the, if you excel at the controllables, life can still be tough when you're in the shadows. So the second thing you need to do in the shadows, you need to build a huddle. You need to have a group of people in your life that you can do life with. People that can pour into you, people that can encourage you, people in your circle that add value. Good morning, 8% Nation. Come on, give me some more energy in the back. I need some more energy in the back. I feel it right here. I feel it right here. I feel it in this section. But back here, I need to feel it. I said, good morning. There we go. You know, I'm a football player, so I like coming into a, a place that feels like a stadium, right? I like that. And who's in charge of the music in here, man? This is the, like the best pregame music. Who's in charge? Where's the DJ? Is it you? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah, you're bringing the heat this morning. You're bringing the heat. Now, I know most of you guys are looking at me right now. It's like, man, this guy played in the NFL for nine years? I know I look like a weird combination between Kevin Hart and 50 Cent. But... <laughs> Yes, I played in the NFL for nine years. It's something that you could Google and you'll find me there. But man, I'm so, I'm so honored to be here with you guys, man. 2020 has uh, been something else. And uh, to be here on stage, to make it here, to be with you guys uh, is a blessing within itself. So thank you for having me. Thank you guys for showing up. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you guys. All right, let's get into it. Let's get into it, man. So I want to go right back to the year 2013. It was a year for me personally that was filled with so much promise and hope. I had just signed my biggest contract to date with the Jacksonville Jaguars. I felt like the stars were aligning for me. I was going back to my home state in Florida. My family could drive up and see me or play on Sundays. Uh, it was my sixth year in the NFL, getting my biggest payday. It ended up being the darkest moment of my life. It was a year filled and riddled with setback, opposition, rejection, you name it. I went through it that season. It was tough. And it first started off on the first day of training camp. Everyone's excited, finally putting on the pads and helmets, showing what you can do. It started off, I get a routine handoff. From my quarterback, I take the ball, I go through the line of scrimmage, I make a move on the safety, I put my foot in the ground, and instantly, I got what they know, what they call now is turf toe, which is a severe sprain of my, my big toe on my right foot. And I was out for the rest of training camp. Couldn't play any of the preseason games, but I had in my mind, I was like, this is my opportunity. I cannot miss this. This is someone taking a chance on me, I wanted to make sure that I put my best foot forward, so I got to be ready for the season opener, right? So I'm rehabbing, I'm doing everything that I could to get back to week one, for week one for my team and for myself. And I get to week one, season opener kicks off. Instantly I see that my reps are limited on the field. I was like, okay, just stay in it. Maybe next week will be different. The next week I see a even more of my workload decreased. The following week, I see that I've been demoted. A couple weeks later, I see myself being on the inactive roster, which means that I'm on practice squad, essentially. I'm a scout team running back. And on Sundays, I'm dressed in street clothes like I am now, but I'm on the sideline watching the game like a fan. This is my sixth year in the NFL. At age 28, when everything was supposed to be coming together for me, I was riddled with all this adversity and setback. And during that time, I remember 
going back to the coaches. Because I was like, man, I can't go out like this. I'm not going to go out without a fight. So I was begging and pleading my case. I was going to the, the coaches, the general manager, anybody would listen. And I would say, let's just give me a chance. If I fail, it's on me. I'm okay with that. Just give me a chance, an opportunity. At the point, I was like, man, we're the Jacksonville Jaguars. We haven't won, we haven't won any games right now. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> right? Amen. What's the worst that could happen? So a few weeks went by, and I'm still on the inactive roster. And I'm still begging and pleading my case and working hard. And finally, around week 12, they say, Justin, you're going to be up this week. I was like, okay, it's go time. I'm preparing all week, doing everything that I need to do, preparing my body, my mind, making sure I'm on my plays, that I know the schemes. Sunday arrives, and we're playing the Houston Texans in Houston. And that was, I was excited because that was the team I played with prior to coming to Jacksonville. So I'm going back, playing some other friends, and I get my opportunity to show what I could do. So I could show the Jaguars, like, you made a mistake. You didn't give me an opportunity, now I'm about to prove you wrong. So I remember at that time, I was a third down running back, so that means I was playing mostly special teams, and I would come in on third down. Kickoff happens at Reliance Stadium, and the first series we get the ball, the first possession, first down goes by, second down goes by. Third down comes, and I'm waiting. I'm over there, anxious, ready to get out on the field, ready for them to call my name. They don't call my name. We don't convert. We punt on fourth down, and I'm waiting. Just trying to stand again, trying to stay locked in, ready for my moment, my opportunity when it comes. Then the next series comes. First down comes. Second down. Third down. They say, fourth set, get in the game. I remember running into the huddle. I sprinted in there. I lined up in the huddle. I had my Mercedes Lewis, my tight end to my left. I had my quarterback, Blaine Gabbard, the pride of Missouri, right there, right by my side. He gives in the play. I'm listening to the huddle intently. He says, far trips right, 23 scat, all go, halfback choice. Then that means absolutely nothing to you guys. <laughs> but it means everything to me because he's essentially clearing out the defense for me. Halfback choice, he's called my name. That means more than likely I'm getting the football here. It's third and five. I break the huddle. I'm lost set. Blaine is to my right. Pride of Missouri. I'm off set to him. And I'm looking at my I'm looking at the defense. I'm looking at the linebacker and I'm licking my chops. He's right where I need him to be. Blaine goes through the cadence. Wide eighty. Wide eighty. See, hey. I take my offset, off step. I'm running to the linebacker. Fast as I can, I make a move on him, stick my foot in the ground, I turn my head. As soon as I turn my head, boom, the ball hits me in my chest like a bullet. I catch it. I'm running. I'm off to the races, 10 yards, 15 yards, 20, 25, 30, 40. I'm going downfield. The crowd is going crazy. All three Jacksonville Jaguars fans that was in the crowd, they were going crazy. Right? Wind blowing through my helmet. I could hear the sounds and cheers. My adrenaline is pumping. I get tackled. Boom. I get tackled downfield. Heart is racing. Beating so fast. I'm so pumped. Feels like my heart is outside of my chest. But something doesn't feel right. I roll over and it feels, I feel something I never felt before. I feel that there's a campfire in my shoe in my cleat. That moment I roll over, medical staff is standing over me. I had just broken my foot. I was heartbroken. I remember looking up, laying on my back, looking up at that dome in Houston, and thinking to myself, this is the last time I'm going to be able to provide for my family by playing football. This is the end of a dream. This is it. A few weeks later, I was placed on injured reserve. A few mo moments down the road, I was fired. 
writing was on the wall. This was my third time being fired at that, to at that point. And when I look back at my time and I ex my experience that season in that dark place, and me begging and pleading for an opportunity, for a chance, going to management, going to the coaches, going to the organization. And I recall them telling me six words over and over again. These six words were things I heard in some form or fashion my entire life. And I asked them for an opportunity. They would give me these six words, and those six words were, we know what you can do. We know what you can do. You see, they were labeling me. They were limiting me. They were placing me in this box. They had this one idea of who they thought I was, and they couldn't get over it. You see, I've always felt like I was on the plus side of good, but it wasn't until my seventh year in the NFL when I got my breakthrough and a chance to really show who I knew I was all along. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I know if you're in this room today, you're on the plus side of good. And I know you're not getting ready for an NFL season. But how many of you ever ever faced adversity, ever, fe ever felt undervalued, underappreciated? Raise your hands. You've been there. It doesn't feel good. But my question to you, even if you're going through the midst of that right now, how are you responding? How are you responding in the midst of adversity? Are you allowing it to cause you to sulk? Or are you allowing it to push you to success? How are you responding when you wake up in the morning and you look in the mirror and you think to yourself, man, I should be a lot further than where I am? When you wake up in the morning and the world is flipped upside down, how are you responding? when it feels like life is giving you its best punches. How are you responding? When you're having trouble breaking through the mezzanine. And I love this illustration of a mezzanine because normally in a nice hotel like this, you have your top floors and your bottom floors and it's normally separated by the mezzanine. Maybe in your career and in your life, you feel right now you're at the bottom floors. And all you need is this one opportunity to show what you can do, to bust through the mezzanine and make it up to the top, to the elite, where you know you deserve to be. How are you responding in the midst of adversity? Today, I'm going to share with you a little bit of my story, and I'm going to chat with you about how better to think about your time when you're waiting on your breakthrough. So what I've come to know over the course of my life is that greatness grows best in the shadows. If you don't get anything else from me here today, I want you to get this. I want you to own this. I want this to soak, soak down into your bones, into your soul. So I want you to repeat after me. Greatness? Come on now, I need energy. Grows best, grows best in the shadows. In the shadows. All right, now I want you to own this now. I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up, and I want you to own this because, like I said, if you don't get anything else from me here today, I want you to get this. In this time in 2020, I want to let you know that greatness grows best in the shadows. Repeat after me. Greatness, greatness. Grows, best grows best in the shadows. I like, I like that. Let's go one more time. Own this. Own this. Greatness. Greatness. Come on, stick your chest out with it. Put your shoulders back. Greatness, Greatness. Grows, best grows best in the shadows. In the shadows. All right, sit down. That's good right there. I like that. I like that energy. What I mean by that is, 
We do not get our greatest gains when we're at the top of the mountain. We get our greatest gains on our, t on our climb and our pursuit to the top. Those moments when we're being challenged, when we're facing adversity, when we're constantly being pulled and stretched and we have to dig deep within ourselves and pull out something that we didn't even know existed in order to take us to the next level in life. Greatness does not happen overnight. It's developed in the mud. Greatness grows best in the shadows. See, most of my life I was in the shadows, in the obscurity. I wasn't in the limelight. I wasn't in the forefront. I was the underdog. Having to do all the work behind the scenes. I had to embrace those moments of adversity and challenge. Being in the shadows, I've learned a lot along the way. One of the things I'm, I, I come to know over the course of my life while being in the shadows is a few things that you need to do. The first thing is when you're in the shadows and you're waiting your breakthrough, you must excel at what you can control. I know most people will tell you you must control what you can control in life, but I'm here to tell you today that you must excel at what you can control because those things will keep you until you get your breakthrough. I realized at a young age that there was a lot out of my control. I grew up in a small town in Mulberry, Florida, a town of 3,000 people. Not a lot of people make it out to accomplish their goals and dreams and aspirations in life. I couldn't control that. You graduate from high school, you go into the phosphate mining industry, or you go work for the uh, Publix grocery store that was headquartered in the town next to us. I couldn't control those things. I grew up in a family of three boys with two parents in the household. I was the middle child. I had my internal demons I was fighting as a middle child. Never really felt that I got the best always feeling left out, not having a place or position. How many older siblings we got here? Who got, how many in here are the oldest? Okay. Okay, I see you in there. I respect you, but uh, <laughs> you guys are uh, spoiled as well. All right, you always got to do the cool things first. What about the babies? What are babies at in here? Oh, I can't stand you guys. <laughs> can't stand you. There's nothing you can do wrong. You're probably still getting treated like babies now at Thanksgiving. They're serving you. Yeah, I see you over there. But I was battling my own internal demons. Then externally, my family, we had our own struggles. Financially unstable most of my childhood. Never owned anything. Bouncing around from place to place. I remember taking baths with bottled waters at our very lowest because we couldn't pay our water bill. I, I remember doing my homework by candlelight, reading my R.L. Stein Goosebumps books by candlelight because we couldn't afford to, to pay the light bill. I remember moments running from the repo man. Am I the only one that ever had interactions with the repo man? Or I remember because we couldn't pay our car note, we're parking our car blocks down the street in a walking home because we didn't want to get our car repossessed. Then at our very lowest, I remember being homeless, living out of a motel. I still remember it like it was yesterday. Still see the room, the door, room 108. Remember walking in and seeing the blue green vomit looking carpet on the floor. The two full-size beds to fit all five of us. See the huge window overlooking the main highway that went through our city. Begging and pleading my dad, Dad, please park in the back. I don't want my classmates to see us in this situation. As a 12-year-old kid, I couldn't control those things. But what I could control was how I thought about those things. How I was determined that day, not allow those moments of adversity to define me, but refine me. 
I made a declaration as that 12 year old that my kids will never have to deal with those things that I was dealing with. My way out, my vehicle out, easy came for me a Sunday afternoon. Watched a guy named Barry Sanders with the Detroit Lions. He wasn't a big guy, he wasn't necessarily the fastest, but he was dynamic. I watched someone that looked like me dip and dash through defenses. I watched him raise the crowds to their feet. I watched him dazzle every Sunday on a terrible team. No offense to any Lions fans in here. I was like, man, I'm going to do that one day. So I knew I had the faith and the belief, but I had to put in the work. I had to put in the time. As soon as I stepped out on a football field, I start hearing critics right away. You're too short. You're too slow. You're too this. You're too that. You'll never make it. This is too big for you. You're going to get hurt. I hear those themes my entire life. It's too short. You're too small. Always freakishly good looking, I would always say that. <laughs> but I had to put in the time. I started to grow in my craft. I remember even visualizing my success because how many of you know it's one thing to just think about and dream about success, but you have to visualize it. You have to see yourself doing it day in and day out. You have to believe that thing. I remember sitting countless nights on my parents' waterbed, looking out the window. Don't judge me. You had a waterbed. Somebody in your family had a waterbed at one point. <laughs> Thinking about the success that I wanted to achieve. So I continued to work. I grew up the ranks, middle school, high school, comes, hearing those same themes, too short, too small. Start having some success early in high school. My parents decide, hey, Justin, we're going to uproot the family. We're going to try to get you in a better situation so you can go to college and actually get a scholarship somewhere. So we moved to Arlington, Texas. Yes, look at some people from Arlington. So we moved to Arlington, Texas, and as soon as I got off the plane, I still heard the doubts and criticism. This is Texas football here, man. The guys are a little bit bigger. There's something in the cornbread and in the water here. They got full beards. They got kids already. It is different football here in Texas. I don't know if you're going to last, but I continue to excel at what I could control. The work, the preparation. While everybody else was partying and drinking in high school, I was doing a thousand push-ups and sit-ups a night. I was thinking about my craft. I had a purpose. I had a vision for my life. I wasn't going to let anything stand in the way. I would read books and watch videos of people that made it out of situations like mine. People like Herschel Walker, people like Jim Abbott, people like Wilma Rudolph. They had laid the blueprint down for me, so I just need to follow that. Sundays after the game, watching the Cowboys play. I was a Cowboys fan growing up. Not so much now. Take it easy. It's all about the Ravens. <laughs> but uh, after the games, I remember I would go out and I would sprint in the middle of Texas heat, training my body and my mind, doing sprints up and down the field, sweat, blood, tears, just me. Motivated by Room 108, those, those times of adversity being uh, rejected, being told that I, I wouldn't make it. Those things fueling me and pushing me closer to my dream. In high school, I wasn't, uh, you know, a highly touted player, but I was having success. I was being productive in my junior, senior year, over 5,000 rushing yards, uh, my two years here in Texas, two state championships. Things were going great. But when the college coaches came down to see me, they would say, ah, he's doing okay, but he's too short, he's too small, he's too this, he's too that. We know what guys like him can do. 
So after my all-star game in my senior year with no scholarship offers, the one I did had, they reneged on it. Notre Dame comes into the picture. And they say, Justin, we want to offer you a scholarship. I was excited. I said, Notre Dame, this is what it's supposed to be. I'm thinking Golden Domer. I'm thinking Touchdown Jesus. I'm thinking Rudy. I'm like, I'm the black Rudy. It just makes sense that I'm going to Notre Dame. Right? And I'm excited. My family excited. We're buying up Notre Dame merchandise. When I'm playing in my basketball games, they're introducing me as a starting shooting guard. Justin Forsett, Notre Dame, commit. I'm excited. Family's excited. And then a week before signing day, I got some terrible news. My dad got a call from Notre Dame, and they said, Justin, we don't need you anymore. A week before signing day. As a 17-year-old kid, I was crushed. I remember running down into my basement, crying my eyes out, getting on my knees and praying and not knowing what to do. Overwhelmed as a 17-year-old kid, being disappointed, being rejected, being frustrated. I was doing everything right. I remember after that time down in that basement, I dust myself off and I remember, if I'm ever gonna make it out of this thing, I gotta excel at the controllables. I gotta stay focused, I gotta stay locked in. I gotta be committed to the process. I have to embrace the shadows. A few months down the road, well into the spring, when people were telling me, man, just go to a junior college, just try to do something else, just put yourself out there and we're still sending tapes out all over the country. And then all of a sudden we get a call from UC Berkeley and my dad gets the call and he says, man, Cal, UC Berkeley wants to offer you a scholarship, son. I was like, what? UC Berkeley wants to offer me a scholarship? Where is UC Berkeley? <laughs> I'm like, man, I grew up in the South, Florida, Texas. We watch it in Florida, Florida State, Miami, Texas, A&M, Oklahoma. Those are the teams I'm watching. I knew, I knew nothing about Cal, but I knew they gave me an opportunity. They believed in me. They gave me that shot. So I go there. And as soon as I got off the plane, it's too short. It's a lot shorter than we thought, a lot smaller than what we thought. And I get it, man, guys. I, I, I'm a short guy. I looked into knee surgery to extend my knees to make me taller, and the science, has, science hasn't caught up yet. But I knew if I excel at the controllables, I'll be all right. If I trust the process, I'll be all right. So I played there, I went there. My freshman year, I was determined to get on the field and play right away. Playing with guys named Aaron Rodgers as my quarterback. We were ranked number 15 in the country at the time. We are number one public institute in the world. I played and came in with another running back the same year, freshman, my roommate, a guy named Marshawn Lynch. We ended up being sort of a big deal. And I remember I was committed to playing so I was going to do whatever it took to make sure that I put myself in the best position possible to succeed. So when uh, right before training camp, they allow the players to go home. And I went home. And normally, we do a paper route as a family. We, uh, as a family, in, while I was in high school, we're driving around. We deliver these uh, nice papers to these lux luxurious hotels throughout the Metroplex. So I'm riding around at 3 a.m. with my family, and we're riding in our PT cruiser and dropping off these papers. And I had in my back, while I wasn't delivering, I had the, my playbook open with my flashlight, reading and studying my plays, because I knew the preparation was key for my success. So when I got there, I was able to dominate, and I was able to put myself in the best position possible. Fast forward, I ended up playing that year. First three years of my college experience was great. I was playing, sharing the backfield with Marshawn Lynch, and then my senior year, I got a chance to start and be the feature running back for Cal. I break records. I had a great season. I was one step closer to my dream. Getting ready for the NFL draft, supposed to go in the third round, ended up falling to pick 233 to the Seattle Seahawks. I played nine years in the NFL and was able to walk away on my own terms. I was 
fired six times. I was rejected. I was demoted. I was stuck in the friend zone. Anybody ever been stuck in the friend zone? Don't raise your hand. Just blink. Just blink real fast. Okay, I see one. I see two. I see three. I don't mean it like that. I mean like I was constantly on teams that say, Justin, we like you, but we don't love you. Not in that way. They didn't want to commit to me. So I bounced around the first couple of years. But I was able to stay because I excelled at the controllables in the shadows. My attitude, my effort, my preparation. But how many of you know, even in the, if you excel at the controllables, life can still be tough when you're in the shadows. So the second thing you need to do in the shadows, you need to build a huddle. You need to have a group of people in your life that you can do life with. People that can pour into you, people that can encourage you, people in your circle that add value. And if you're the only person in your circle that adds value, then it's not a circle, it's a prison. You need to leave that circle immediately and find a new group. You need people that are building you back up, people that allow you to be open and transparent and vulnerable, because vulnerability leads to growth. When I got in a huddle with Peyton Manning when I was with the Colts, he would give me three things. He would give me warning, he would give me encouragement, and he would give me instruction. We not only need that on the playing field, but we need that in our day-to-day -day life. Here in 2020, you need to do life with some people. You need to lock arms with some people that can, that can sharpen you and mold you. Not yes men, but people that are going to tell you when to push and when to pivot. People that allow you to be yourself. When the critics and the doubt comes into your mind and, and, and you hear the gossip about you, these are people that are going to remind you who you are. They're going to allow you, they're going to, they're going to keep you accountable. They're going to allow you to be successful because they're going to remind you that you're not in it by yourself. The next thing you need to do while you're in the shadows is you need to serve. I understand that you're thinking like, man, Justin, if I'm battling adversity, if I'm going through my own things, if I'm going through struggles, why would I help someone else? Because serving shifts the perspective. Serving lifts the weight of that burden. Serving shifts the perspective from being me driven to purpose driven. See, I believe all of us in here were created for impact and greatness. It lives inside of us. And if you're created for impact and greatness, it does not fluctuate on your circumstance. Whether you're having a good season or a bad season, whether you're having a good time or a bad time in life, when you're going through obstacles or you're going through peaks or valleys in life, it doesn't matter. You're called for impact. It should flow out of you. You need to serve. And sometimes when we're battling adversity and we're in the shadows of life, Sometimes we just need a reason to smile. We just need a reason to put a, put a smile on our face. And there's no greater way to do that than to serve your fellow man. They say, the Chinese proverb, if you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, go fishing. If you want happiness for a month, get married. Don't tell my wife I said that, all right? If you want happiness for a year, inherit wealth. But if you want happiness for a lifetime, serve somebody. It is better to give than receive, ladies and gentlemen. If you're going through a dark time in life, serving is the currency to elevation. If you want to grow, if you want to be more, if you want to do more, serve. And if you're a leader, it's an imperative. It's a non-negotiable. If you're leading your family, your workplace, your community, you must serve. And if you feel that you're too big to serve, then you're too small to lead. If you feel that you are too big to serve, then you are simply too small to lead. So serve. And embrace the shadows, embrace the obstacles, embrace the adversity. It took me 15 years of doing the same things over and over again until I got my breakthrough. 
15 years of commitment and discipline, rejection, demotion, of doing the same things over and over again, being consistent, embracing those moments. You see, everybody wants a breakthrough, but nobody wants to be broken. Everybody wants the breakthrough, but nobody wants to be broken. But sometimes in order to, to achieve success, we got to go through a season of brokenness because those things are refining us. We're carving out things in our life that don't belong, that can't, that can't stay with us in order to take us to the next level in life. We have to embrace those moments because those moments are preparing us for our opportunity. Those moments are shaping us for our opportunity preparing us and there's a difference between being ready and being prepared you see I believe that being ready is just an emotional state but being prepared is being physically spiritually and mentally positioned to seize a moment a couple years back I was in Baltimore I living in a three-story town home and in the middle of the night around 2 a.m. my security system goes off and I'm laying in bed with my wife and I see the wake up and I see the lights flashing, the sirens going off, and I turn to my wife and say, get up, somebody's trying to get into our house right now. I remember she was wiping the crust out of her eyes. She said, babe, why would anybody be trying to get into our house right now? I was like, that's the wrong question to be asking right now. Why? Go get the kids, protect them, stay upstairs, I'll be back. I went downstairs, my heart is racing, I'm pumping, I'm sweating. I go to the first floor, the lights are on, I'm like, okay, the coast is clear, nobody's down here. I go to the kitchen, I was like, let me grab something. I grab a knife, it was a butter knife, you know what I'm saying? I'm in trouble, but I went to, I thought, I was like, okay, if somebody's about to break in here, I'm most susceptible downstairs because I have a sliding glass door in the back, that's probably where the intruder got in. So I'm going down the steps, my heart is racing, I'm thinking about the Under Armour com commercial, we must protect this house! <laughs> and I get down to the light switch, I'm about to turn on the light and I'm about to try to do my best Steven Seagal with this butter knife. And I had an epiphany. And I thought to myself, this guy might have a gun. And I have a butter knife. I'm ready, but I'm not prepared. There's a difference. Now in that instance, there was no intruder. My wife had left a crack in the door and it flew open. The wind blew it open. The security system went off. But I wanted to encourage you tonight, but today that there's a difference between being ready and being prepared. Those moments in the shadows are preparing you for your opportunity when it comes because we don't know when it's going to come. So we have to be prepared at all times. 2014, the year prior, 2013, with the Jacksonville Jaguars, I didn't know if I would ever play football again. I figured if I can't play for the Jaguars, who can I play for? I, I get the call in 2014 from the Baltimore Ravens. Had an issue with their running back, started running back, so I was thrust into the lineup. They signed me. We're going to give you a shot. Thrust into the lineup, the starting lineup, and I run with it. Had my best season to date. I was five, I was top five rusher. I was a, a top 100 player. Going through the middle of that season, having all that success, around week 12 or week 10, we were scheduled to play the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I was thinking to myself all week, I was just like, Justin, just stay in the moment. Allow the game to come to you. Don't get too emotional because these were the same people that counted me out. These were the same people that left me out to dry, left me for dead, didn't give me an opportunity to even provide for my family. I said, Justin, just stay in the moment. It was very emotional. We'll get to Sunday, and I remember like it was yesterday. It was an overcast day in Baltimore, Maryland, at M&T Bank Stadium. I remember going out, getting out for warm-ups, and taking the field and seeing my old teammates with the Jags and they're coming up to me and say, Justin, man, we're hugging me. We're so happy for you. You made it to the other side. 
and I'm going around shaking hands and I, I finish up my stretching and my warm up, getting a sweat in before I get ready to go into the locker room. And right when I was going into the locker room, I got stopped by a coach, my former coach for the Jaguars. He says, one of the coaches, he said, Justin, I'm excited for you, man. I'm happy for you. And he says, everyone is trying to figure out why you're having so much success right now. You're 29 years old. You're still short. <laughs> What's happening? And he says, we're having staff meetings about it. And, and when I'm, what I'm telling the staff is that, man, you're finally in the right system. And I remember hearing that and boiling up on the inside. I said, all right, coach, thank you. I was boiling up on the inside because he was not giving credit to my hard work and discipline. He wasn't giving credit to my ability to excel at what I could control. He wasn't giving the credit to my ability to build a huddle, to make people better around me, to serve those around me in need. He was giving credit to a system. It had nothing to do with me in his mind. I went to that locker room and I'm still boiling up on the inside and I'm not an emotional guy. I sit down to my locker and I'm overwhelmed with emotion. Tears are streaming down my face. My fullback looks over to me, Kyle Juszczyk at the time, he says, man, are you okay? I said, I'm all right. I'm going to be all right. And as I'm sitting down there with my head down and listening to my music, I'm starting to think about all the things I had to overcome to get to this moment. That room 108, that rejection from Notre Dame, those times when I had to take baths with bottled waters, that moment in that hotel room, that motel room at the edge of town. I start being overwhelmed. I've cried five times in my life, ladies and gentlemen. Four of those times were Lifetime movies. I'm a sucker, I'm a sucker for drama, you know. Don't don't judge me. So I'm at my locker and I'm still emotional. And now normally Coach Harbaugh, when we're in the locker room, he does two things. So we do a team prayer and then we do a pep talk. We go through the team prayer and we get to our pep talk and before we go out and take the field, and tears are still streaming down my face as I'm locked on with my brothers in that locker room. And when I was looking forward, I see a teammate that locks eyes with me. His name is Steven. And he sees, sees the, the tears streaming down my face. And he gives me a head nod as if he understood what I was going through. Coach finished his pep talk and we took the field. And as I'm going to my locker, Steven comes over to me and I'll never forget what Steven did. Steven wrapped his arms around me. He said, bro, we got you. We love you, man. We here for you, we believe. And at that moment, I realized that I wasn't in this thing by myself. I didn't get to this moment by myself. I had people that believed in me. I had a support system. And I knew at that moment that I was of value, no matter what happened to me, no matter my performance on that field, it was something deeper. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know what you're going through in your life right now. I know it's tough out there. 2020 has thrown us its best shots. You're having to, you're being forced to rethink how you do work. There's a new normal. You may be facing rejection. The paychecks ain't coming in like they used to. You're not traveling like you used to. You have to do Zoom meetings and Skype meetings and Microsoft Team meetings. You're getting out of your comfort zone. You're in the shadows of life right now. Maybe you've lost some loved ones. The economy is upside down. It's a pandemic going on. There's racial injustices going on. There's social unrest going on. 
I want to encourage you right now to embrace those moments in the shadows. And I want to remind you, like Stephen reminded me, that you are loved. You have value. And it's not based on your performance. I want to encourage you that to embrace the shadows because greatness is not developed overnight. It's developed in the mud. I don't know if you noticed outside, it's muddy out there. And where there's mud, there's opportunity. Where there's shadows, there's opportunity for growth, for development, for efficiency. So you, I want to encourage you today to excel at what you can control, to build a huddle, and to serve. I'm going to leave you with this last passage that I love. It says, do not grow weary in doing good works. For in due season you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. 8% nation. Excel at what you can control. Build a huddle. Lock arms with men and women in this room. Serve your fellow man. But remember this, most of all, do not give up. That's my time. Hey, if you enjoyed this, I got another one you're going to love. It's right there. Click on it. See you in there. I have four boards up here. We don't have that much time today. But I love to talk, by the way. I talk all day. So on one side, you have the inner world, which represents all the things that happen up here between your ears before you.